Hello again everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, I'm going to play back an interview that I had with Pierre from Sendio, the makers of ThinLink. ThinLink is something that I've covered on the channel before. It's basically a remote desktop solution that lets you turn your Linux server into a remote desktop server. And since it has clients available for macOS, Windows, and of course Linux, among other platforms, it's probably the case that your device has a client for ThinLink. If you want to get started with ThinLink, I uploaded a video earlier this year that covers everything you need to know to get started with it, and I'll leave a card for that video right about here. However, since that video came out, there's a brand new version of ThinLink available, and it has some interesting changes, so I figured it would be a fun conversation to sit down with someone from Sendio and discuss the new version. So what I'm going to do right now is play back the interview with Pierre. So I'm here with Pierre from Sendio, the makers of ThinLink. How you doing? I'm doing very well, Jay. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. So you, you guys have a new release of your flagship software, a lot going on, a lot to talk about. I have some questions for you, and I figured it'd be fun to just dive in and find out what it's like behind the scenes, but also just to see what we have coming in the new version, or I should say what we already have in the new version because it's already out. And um, let's just get started. But before we do, how about you just go ahead and introduce yourself if um, anyone watching isn't already familiar with you. Mm -hmm. Glad to do so. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm one of the veterans here at Sandio. Uh, I've been here actually since 2005. I started back then as a, uh, as a developer, developing ThinLink. Uh, but uh, the last few years, I've uh, gradually moved over more and more to product planning for, for specifically ThinLink uh, these days. So. My main responsibility is, is uh, keeping an eye on, on what's happening out there, what people need, what, uh, uh, what to expect out there, and, and try to make sure we have a good product, not just today, but also in the future. Um, so, and gladly things like this as well, talking about uh, what we've done so far. Must be really exciting. And speaking of exciting, um, let's talk about FinLink. I did a video about it, a full tutorial some time back, but for those in my audience that haven't seen that and aren't familiar with the product, and um, could you just explain what it is and the goal that it attempts to solve? Yeah, um, it's, it's um, for those a bit familiar with the area at least, it's uh, what we like to call the product a uh, Linux remote desktop server. Uh, and for those who've been around a bit longer, they might be more familiar with the term terminal server. Uh, which is basically putting all your applications and desktops on a centralized system, um, a big server basically, and having all of your stuff coming from there instead of having individual laptops, workstations, uh, things like that. Um, and the point of this setup is mainly to make things more practical. Uh, it, it, for system administrators, it means there's fewer machines to take care of. Uh, for users, it, it can usually mean they can access things a lot more easily. Uh, in our case, we see a lot of usage is, is driven by people being on Windows machines, they're being on Mac OS machines, on Chromebooks, uh, things like that, but they still uh, want to use Linux systems and, and Linux desktops, right. Linux applications. Uh, uh, so that's sort of the high level uh, idea of, of the system. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So, what would you? Uh, so, what's the target audience for ThinLink? Who, who's the best fit for this uh, piece of software? Uh, well, ideally, we like to be flexible, and we'd like to say everyone. Um, well, with the sort of fine note of everyone who uses Linux and wants to use Linux. Um, but we are fully aware that Linux is still a, a niche uh, system. It's the year of the Linux desktop. We are still waiting for that. I think. Um, right. so, so in practice, uh, we are where Linux is mostly, or specifically where Linux uh, desktops and Linux applications are, which is mainly uh, research, engineering, um, supercomputers, um, IT infrastructure, those classical tech areas uh, is usually where, where we are as well uh, there. But uh, we, sort of, we haven't specifically designed the product for that, it's just where... Where Linux is, we are, and where Linux isn't, uh, it's natural that there isn't that much ThinLink usage uh, there. Um, 
So that's sort of the use cases. Uh, probably good to mention as well that our sort of target is, or our view of ThinLink is that it's a first and foremost, a big volume product. So it's built for big systems. Uh, I think our biggest installation is around 10,000 users uh, running on wow. the same system there. Uh, so that's sort of what we designed the system for primarily being able to scale to accommodate a lot of things. Um, and again, it's practical reasons. It's a lot easier to take care of of um, a couple of uh, a bunch of servers than ten thousand workstations and things like that. Right. Um, I should mention though that just because that's our target, it doesn't mean that it's the only use case within Link. We have a lot of usage as well for sort of uh, remote administration, uh, things like that, um, especially sort of in the in the hobbyist market, I, I'd say we have a, a lot of uh, sysadmins that are using ThinLink at work, are using ThinLink at home. Um, my myself, I'm using it to easily uh, access my play servers at home. It's, uh, it's a convenient way of, of starting things and not just be restricted to SSH. You can have graphical things up and running and you can leave your terminals up and running. So it's it's pretty nice for, for small usage as well, even though that m might not have been the idea when we first designed the product. And speaking for myself, I don't leave the home much. Uh, I'm, I'm working from home all the time, but I still find it very useful because, and this may not be like a very common use case, but having all of my work on one server that I can connect to, because I use multiple computers. I, I think I counted seven or eight computers in this room right here. So um, it, it's kind of uh, difficult to figure out, you know, what computer you were last using that you last saved something on, and you could have things in a central location connect to it. There's your work. That's what you're working on. Then I can restart my computers. It doesn't matter. I don't have to close any apps or anything. Um, I know that's not like a super common use case for you guys, but I have to imagine I'm probably not the only one, right? Yeah, actually, I'm gonna have to protest a bit there. Uh, I think that's usually uh, one. Not one of the things that we sort of open with because it can. We've noticed it's a bit difficult for people to really sort of realize what this means for them, but it's one mm -hmm. of the primary things we hear from users once they've actually started using the product and they started getting familiar with it. Uh, that this ability to just hop around machines is is probably one of the big uh, sort of uh, for end users big uh, wins of using a system like this. Um, I mean, we have a lot mm -hmm. of people saying. Well, in your case, you're working only from home, but for those who are switching between working from home and working from the office, previously, perhaps they had to lug around a laptop uh, back and forth to make sure they had all their stuff with them if they need to do something at home. Mm -hmm. But now they can just leave the things at the office. Once they get home, they can just open the stuff. It looks exactly like they left it. Um, and even things like working on the train if they're commuting and things like that. So uh, that's definitely one of the sort of hidden gems that the users find when they start putting everything centrally instead of, of in, on individual machines. Uh, um. Or in my case, rend that... rendering an entire video that's on a, a server and I don't have to have the CPU on my computer going crazy, which is always fun too. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, before we get too far into the use cases, because I get totally excited about things like this, I think we should probably also talk about what sets ThinLink apart from other solutions out there. Um, I'd say there are uh, two main areas. Um, they are perhaps slightly philosophical uh, rather than technical. Uh, I think we have a really nice technical product as well, but I think the areas where we shine is more how we approach things and, and, and uh, where we put uh, the finer polish uh, in the product. And uh, the first thing I'd say is we have a, a big focus on making things very easy to use. We, we think that you should... It doesn't matter how good capabilities you have if you have to fiddle and spend a lot of time tweaking and adjusting and building things. Nobody's going to like that. Uh, we want a nice out-of-box experience. Um, uh, and hopefully people have people who've tried it have already seen this. We put a lot of effort into trying to make the installer as, as, as easy as possible. You don't generally have to change any settings out-of-box or anything. It Install it and it's up and running. Um, but we also look at all kind of smaller details in how our uh, tools are designed and how our documentation is written, how our error messages are presented uh, to users. Uh, we want to put that extra effort to making it feel like uh, it's pleasant to work with this software, not just functional. Um, 
so that's definitely one of our uh, sort of core differences we try to to sort of highlight. Uh, I'd say the other one is is primarily compared to the big players in this market, and that's that we are a Linux focused company, uh, entirely Linux focused. So that's all we do. We deliver Linux desktop and applications to users as conveniently as possible. Um, so that means we have a much stronger focus than uh, many other big players in having everything familiar and and the way uh, an experienced Linux users want things. It, it behaves, the, the configuration files look like other Linux configuration files, the tools behave like other Linux tools. All of that stuff is, is we, we target it very heavily towards people who are familiar and like the Linux experience and ThinLink should fit in nicely towards everything else they have rather than being some odd side system that behaves in a different manner. Um, yeah. Part of that is also uh, we value flexibility a lot. We like the Linux sort of experience of, of you have a lot of components and you can build your own systems exactly how you want them. And we want ThinLink mm -hmm. to follow that as well. Uh, ThinLink should fit in with your system. It shouldn't uh, dictate as much as how your system looks like. And practically that means we have a fairly short requirements list and, and we try to work with all of the different system components and make sure that it works on your system, not on a system just like the way we want it. Um, um, so those are probably the two sort of core philosophy things we have. And, and it's probably not these big things that it shows in it's a lot of the small details in, in how we present things. Yeah, and, and from the video, when I was doing the video, it was very easy to set up. It was very straightforward. I had no issues whatsoever. Um, but now, especially no one will have any issues if they would have, because I have the whole tutorial that is out there. If um, you haven't seen it yet, you should. And um, throughout the entire experience, I, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. It was easy to set up. It, it fit right in. And that was before the new version. It was already really good back then. We'll get into the new version here shortly. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what uh, um, how it's used in home lab and small office um, enterprise and things like that. Where does this fit in in the different vectors? Um, well, we have a few different areas, and uh, from ranging from small installations to to very big ones. Um, but a a big sort of business leg, I think, is the expression. Uh, a big area for us is the we like to group them as. Uh, access to uh, big resources that, uh, like you mentioned, uh, you have you can have an, a very lightweight laptop, but you need a big beefy CPU to do the video uh, processing. Uh, in our case, our customers are commonly uh, supercomputers, uh, big GPU farms, uh, things like that, big big ROM machines where they need to do usually research on very big machines. Um, so previously they mm -hmm. they had to either copy data back and forth uh, a lot of complexity or they had to b buy very expensive workstations to do all, all their stuff uh, which they generally then couldn't lug around they had to work at one specific place to be able to do these things so uh, this is a big win for those kind of customers that they can access the big resources from anywhere and, and can still do this this advanced work um, another big one is it makes it very easy for people who want to deploy Linux software in an environment where Linux sort of is, is the odd man out, uh, which is, to be honest, very common in, in many places that many places mm -hmm. standardize on Windows laptops, uh, uh, and but they still need Linux applications for some use cases. Uh, we see mm -hmm. this primarily among uh, engineers who have like uh, flow simulation uh, software and design software. Uh, and also in in the IT sector where they have management of, of networks and, and things like that. So it allows uh, you to give those users uh, Linux applications in a way that doesn't interfere with the fact that you normally have uh, Windows machines or Mac machines or even perhaps Chromebooks and, and things like that. So it, it gives people a lot of flexibility of deploying uh, the applications people's needs. So these are still probably a bit bigger installations. I say for the smaller installations, I think the big use case is, as I mentioned, remote administration. Uh, you have servers uh, out there or, or uh, workstations, perhaps even in some cases, there, where you want to have uh, easy remote access uh, to them for, for some changes and, and, and things like that. And 
previously, perhaps everybody was fine using command lines, but these days there are a lot of graphical tools you want to use, even as using system administration. So uh, it's nice to oh. not have to limit yourself to. Uh, uh, for example, you, you can have X11 forwarding for those who are familiar with that. For, uh, as a way of having remote uh, graphical application, but it, it has downsides like if you close the connection, your application is gone. Um, as we mentioned right. before, ThinLink allows you to keep your stuff running and, and you can come back to it whenever you want. Um, uh, so that's probably uh, the big use case for smaller, smaller installations. Um, All right. Um, so recently you guys released version 415 of ThinLink and um, it almost sounds like a point release, but it's anything but because there's quite a bit of... Uh, new polish and, and things in this new release. So I figured it'd be fun to talk about this new version and what you guys have added to it and what the inspiration was for the things that you've added. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the first thing people who are upgrading probably notice is that things look uh, quite a bit different. Uh, we've uh, done a, a big overhaul of the sort of the, the look and feel of, of not just ThinLink, but also the, the company Sendio here. Um, we also had a look at uh, improving the command line experience for our system administrator. Uh, we primarily by adding a new command line tool to make things a bit easier to handle these systems. Uh, and finally, the, the third uh, notable change we did here was to tweak the license agreement a bit uh, in order to allow people to uh, uh, basically spread our ThinLink server around a bit. That was unfortunately restricted for for old reasons, but uh, we want people to be able to pre-install ThinLink or if they want to include ThinLink in their uh, package repositories or things like that. Uh, we think we want to make it as easy as possible for people to get access to ThinLink. So we did some tweaks there as well. Yeah. So that means somebody could effectively put ThinLink, um, you know, install the client in their deployment image for their workstations, for example, and that's just part of the image and already there, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and to be cl to clarify, the, we've actually always had uh, the ability, uh, the permission to do that for the client, but uh, we were restricted mm -hmm. about the server. So it's the server side we've changed now. So if people want to have yeah. prepared uh, images on Amazon or something like that with ThinLink pre-installed, that's just fine now. Previously, we probably wouldn't uh, be mad about anybody doing that, but it was formally not allowed in, in the license agreement. So we we got things adjusted so everybody should feel safe doing things like that. Awesome. Now, um, my understanding, a big part of the new release was new branding. So I figured we could talk a little bit about that and what you guys are trying to achieve with that new branding, the inspiration behind it, and what people have to look forward to as soon as they upgrade, if they haven't already done so. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's been quite some time. I haven't checked the exact number, but it's been many years since we did the last refresh of our branding. So we felt uh, it was probably time. It, it started to look a bit dated and, and uh, it, it needed to look nice and, and current. Uh, I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to lose focus on things like that. You easy to look at just functional things, but uh, in order to have a, a good computing experience, it's nice if things look like they fit together and everything looks and feels familiar. So uh, this was primarily driven by uh, getting things up to date. So it looks like it fits in with everything else that people are using. Um, when it comes to simple things like uh, color schemes for icons, but also uh, font sizes and things like that, which have changed over the years. Uh, there. Uh, uh, we also try to make, try to be better at being more consistent about our branding so to make sure that people feel familiar when they hop between the application, they hop between our website, the documentation and all of that. So uh, try to be, put up a bit more rules for us internally to make sure we, we stay to a, a same kind of look everywhere. So that was also a big, a big thing here. And I think that's a, a continuous work. So we're probably not fully there yet, but uh, we've started the process now and getting everything more and more in sync. Hopefully people like the new look as well. I think we're, we're proud of it here. It seems like user interface design is, is something that can't possibly be completed because it's always like a moving target. There's always something to tune. There's always something to change. And when you get it right, you know, of course, toolkits change and desktops change. So it's got to be pretty cool to modernize it. But I would imagine there's probably tuning to do from here on out. I know some applications have come out with a new version. And then for several versions later, they're still tweaking it. So... 
um, yeah, I think that is, it's amazing to do that and, and bring it more current. But um, am I right? Is that more of a moving target, like just continually something that needs to be adjusted even just a little bit? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, we, it's, uh, if nothing else, the software is uh, changing constantly. We're adding new features, we're rethinking old features. And uh, again, back to we want the system to be easy to use. And, and I mean, we have to admit sometimes we've done things in the wrong way. We had a wrong picture of pe how people are using it. So when we get more feedback from our users that uh, it can allow us to better tweak things, then we definitely try to do so. Um, I think the biggest obstacle is is the the balance of uh, not changing things too much too often. Uh, again, on easy to use, nobody likes if every time they update, things have moved around, so they they have to find things again and, and where they are. So, right. uh, so we try to fi find a balance of of when we do the the tweaks and the cleanups, and, and depending on how much better we think it'll actually be uh, in the new change. So, but yeah, it's definitely a continuous work. We're always trying to see how we can improve things. Awesome. So regarding the new version, there's a new command line tool for system administrators to use. So um, how about we talk a little bit about that new feature and what administrators can do with it? Right. So this is a feature that's actually been discussed for some time. And if you're part of the uh, our community website, <coughs> you've probably seen some discussions there as well about it. It's sort of, uh, people like to do things in different ways. And we've had uh, ways of managing things from our web interface, but uh, we haven't uh, had an equivalent way of doing things from the command line as well. So uh, that hasn't been necessarily an explicit choice. We just, we started in one end. Um, so now we've finally gotten to the, the other side as well, uh, giving the command line the same kind of features. Um, so it's actually no, not much in new capabilities. It's more about doing it in a different way that feels more familiar to people who prefer the command line. So, uh, and the specific features we looked at was the ones that we got the most requests for, basically. So we tried to listen to the users here. And that was um, session management. So uh, basically listing sessions, looking at which users are logged in, where are they logged in, how long have they been logged in. Uh, things like that, and also being able to terminate sessions when the the system administra administrator sees there's something wrong with a the session, they can help the users out and and kill those sessions. Um, so just making life easier for system admins, I guess. Precisely. So th this is to uh, to be completely clear. This is just a a server side tool. So it's uh, if you're an end user of ThinLink, unfortunately, they, this doesn't help you directly, but hopefully it makes your sysadmin more happy uh, and and. Um, more easy to deal with. Well, sysadmin in a better mood is a, is a def definitely a benefit for everyone. I can probably add as well that this was the primary th focus we did for, for sort of the command line thing, but we also had a look at uh, the command line experience as a whole as well, and we saw some more gaps that we tried to fill in. And, and the big mm -hmm. one here is also we have now man pages for all our, all our tools here as well. Uh, so nice. previously you had to look up the, the HTML documentation, but now you can just do man for all our commands from the, when you're logged in, just as you can for most other uh, commands on the system. Um, so that should hopefully make things uh, a lot easier. And as a little preview, we're also trying to get uh, tab completion up and running. Um, it won't be in the upcoming release, but I'm hoping it's not too far away. So to make things even easier for, for command line users. Really, really cool. So there's also a web client. So we have a web client and a native client. So I was hoping we could take a moment to explain the difference between them and why someone would use one over the other, uh, excuse me, one over the other. So the native client is, is definitely our primary client. Uh, it's the one who has the most features and it's the one who has the best performance. Uh, so. Uh, the web client is is complementary, but it's it's a very good client still. We try to put a lot of effort into that one as well. Um, so if you want all the bells and whistles, you should use the native client. But the web client is very convenient since you don't have to download anything. You can just open a URL in, in any modern browser and log in and you can access your system anywhere. Um, so in some cases, that might not even be a matter of convenience, but the only option because you're not allowed to download things on this machine. Um, right. It, it yeah. also has a very pro uh, important role in the fact that we, since it is a native client, the other one, it means that we have to do 
things for specific platforms. So the native client is then unfortunately not available on every platform. Um, it's on Linux, it's on Windows, and it's on Mac OS. Uh, but if you're running a, a platform other than those, uh, you need to use the, the web-based client. So uh, that means if you're on iOS or Android or Chromebooks, uh, you use the web client instead. Um, uh, but even though performance is better in the native client, the web client is not far behind. So for most use cases, you will not tell a difference between them. Uh. Awesome. So I, I can't believe I forgot to bring this up earlier in the interview, but we, we talked a bit about other operating systems. You mentioned Mac OS and, and others. So what platforms does ThinLeak uh, support? Because it's definitely more than just Linux. So I thought we could talk a little bit about that and see uh, you know, who could utilize it. Yeah, so the, the, uh, you have to separate, in this case, the, the server side and the, the client side. So our sort of mm -hmm. mantra for this company is uh, <clears throat> we make sure that everybody who wants to use Linux can use Linux. Um, so for the server side, it's 100% Linux. Uh, we try to be as flexible as possible of which Linux systems, but it's just Linux mm -hmm. on, on the server side. So it's always about Linux desktop and Linux applications. But again, the core idea is everybody should be able to access these desktops and these applications. So we want the client to be available everywhere. Uh, so as much as practically possible. So practically that means we've, we've targeted the big three um, desktop platforms with Linux, Mac and, and Windows, uh, and then we developed the web access client as a way of, of uh, fulfilling the, the need, not just for people who don't want to download, but also to make sure we had coverage on all the platforms that we first, not yet at least, have a native client for. Um, okay. And uh, so how about the Raspberry Pi? We do have an ARM client. So if you have Linux on the Raspberry Pi, that should work fine. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Is there another OS available for Raspberry, or is it just Linux? Well, th there are, but it, it's just that Linux, it's, it's one platform where Linux almost you know, completely dominates. I know there is a version of Windows for it that at least was available, might still be available, but it's not something you really hear people talking about much. Now, we unfortunately don't have a Windows ARM client, but at least I'm not sure about uh, Windows on, on Raspberry, but I know Windows on their bigger ARM um, machines uh, has x86 emulation and then the Thinlink client works just fine on that one. Um, so that platform should work fine. But yeah, Raspberry Pis, we have a lot of users using those and uh, as long as you don't try to push uh, too much things through them, they, they work fine as clients. For no, normal usage, they're, they're nice little convenient machines. Oh, they, sh they sure are. Yeah, absolutely. I get to check out the Raspberry Pi 5 pretty soon, which I, I'm really excited to, to try that out. But um, it's come a long way, and there's a lot of fans of it. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to be excited to hear that it's something that they can install the client on because that'll open up a lot of doors, especially if they have a web browser running on a server with lots of RAM. Then the RAM, uh, the minimal RAM on a Raspberry Pi, all of a sudden isn't so much of a burden anymore. And I think that's probably one of the many clever ways you can use a solution like this, your imagination is pretty much the only limit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the Raspberry Pi really sort of shows the how much this transforms your usage. Uh, we have a Raspberry Pi here testing and, and I'd say using Chrome on that thing and, and doing some heavier websites is, is a bit painful in, in many cases, but open a thin link session yeah. and it feels like you're sitting on a powerful workstation and everything just smooth and, and nice. Uh, so uh, it's it's really convenient. Um, uh, I think I, I saw um, somebody, uh, my colleague of mine did a measurement and actually running the Thinlink client in, in a tab in Chrome used less resources than running a just a simple web page. So it's always less resources using Thinlink than using a normal web page. That's awesome. Yeah, especially, I mean, Chrome users know what you're talking about when it comes to resource usage. <laughs> But it's very popular. I'm not knocking anyone. It, it's probably the more uh, common choice for browsers. Um, switching gears a little bit, we mentioned the community several times, and my understanding is you guys aren't just a part of the community, you participate in it. So I thought we could talk a little bit about that. Yes, uh, I think uh, we've always been a, a very community-oriented uh, company. It's, um, I'd say it's, it's strongly connected to the, the strong Linux connection of, of uh, this company. It's difficult to be in the Linux system without uh, sort of adopting the, 
the open source way of thinking and and uh, and how all of that community work uh, works so uh, but this this is a very core thing and something we discuss a lot internally here that we want to be a participant in the community is not just somebody who's standing on the sideline and, and benefits uh, from the open source thing so uh, we have a wide range of collaboration there um, but why we are perhaps I should mention why we are in the community at least from our point of view and, and that's we, we strongly believe in this idea of collaboration allows us to get more out of it than we put into it that if we do mm -hmm. things together uh, many small companies can do a lot of big things together that they couldn't do each on their own. So that's that's a core mindset in us. So uh, we think it's very important that we contribute what we do and hopefully others contribute their parts and we all get uh, a lot nicer things out of it. Um, but our, contrib oh. co our contributions are high and low, big and small. Um, the big ones are probably the ones that, the biggest one are the core ones for, for our product, uh, which is... Uh, Tiger VNC and no VNC, uh, which if you've been using some remote systems, uh, open source systems, you've probably heard of them. Uh, so we are mm -hmm. uh, definitely the biggest uh, contributors to those projects and have been uh, for some while because they are important to us. Uh, but we are by no means the, the only contributors to, to them. They are very nice to see big, lively projects. So they are good examples of this collaboration thing that we really want to see, see get going. So, you, so even people that don't use uh, ThinLink are benefiting from the work that you guys do. Definitely, definitely, and and uh, sometimes it can be a bit of balance of of uh, of, of competition and collaboration. But uh, we've taken a strong stance that we need to uh, separate our business side from our uh, community side, and they should not be allowed to conflict with each other. Uh, we do what's good for the for Thanks. the community projects uh, because we believe good community projects are good for us in the long term. But those are not the only project we're involved in. We also have a bunch of, of uh, different projects in, uh, or components that are used in ThinLink, and we try to be as active as we can in those projects. Uh, uh, those We rarely develop new features for them, but every now and then we had to do bug fixes and small tweaks to those, and we really want to make sure we give those fixes back to the community. Uh, then mm -hmm. they're not always they're accepted, but we at least try. We put up pull requests, we put up bug reports, and try to give our code changes back to the communities uh, that we use. And some mm -hmm. examples are OpenSSH, which is used in the product, um, Pulse Audio, uh, the audio server used on uh, or used on Linux. I think it's been getting replaced by Pipewire. I think, but uh, mm -hmm. it was big uh, back in the day, and we probably have a whole bunch of smaller components like that. Um, and then we probably have the uh, uh, third tier there, which is that if we find bugs in things, we try to at least report them so that the people have an opportunity to fix them. Um, I think mm -hmm. this, this is mostly visible when it comes to web browsers. Um, I, a project like NoVNC and a product like ThinLink uh, tends to push the boundaries we've noticed when it comes to web technology. We do a lot of uh, cutting edge and odd stuff uh, when doing a remote desktop in a, in a web browser. And, uh, we uh, quite often run into two bugs in the browsers that we need to uh, to get them to fix basically so we have a lot of bug reports to firefox and to chrome and to edge and and all the different ones uh, oh that's i really appreciate that that's awesome but we think it's a big part of collaborating if we don't report the bugs then we can't really complain that they don't fix them it's always step one that makes sense to me all right. Um, so what are some things that we can expect from Sendio and ThinLink going forward? Any uh, juicy details, a scoop or anything like that? Nothing big I can uh, sort of uh, uh, reveal right now, but we, I can give you an overview at least of what we're sort of thinking for the next, for the coming year or so. Uh, and that's, uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to focus on getting new users uh, into ThinLink as well. Uh, and not just getting them no, letting them know about ThinLink, but also making their experience even easier. Um, I mentioned the installer, which we think is, is really nice, but there are still some, some corner cases where people get stuck when they're installing ThinLink the first time and it doesn't work. Uh, they need to tweak things. Um, and we'd ideally like to get rid of them. We would like every user to be able to install ThinLink and it just works. Uh, so we have a mm -hmm. list of, of some common 
things that people get stuck on. And, and we sort of, we're going to try and see if we can change things in the product, improve documentation, what we can do to make sure that these people do not get stuck and get their thin link installation up and running. Um, and I think the first one is looking at people who are behind uh, one of these uh, network address translation firewalls, um, uh, which is mm -hmm. common when people are deploying things in, in Amazon's cloud and, and thing, environments like that. They usually get an internal IP address instead of an external one. And that right. tends to wreak havoc with uh, how ThinLink works. Um, so it's, it's always solvable, but uh, people, we see people struggling finding the documentation and the instructions for doing that. So we're going to see if we can maybe tweak the installer to help out, make the parts of the documentation more prominent. Uh, we'll see what we find, basically. Uh, yeah. Okay. That, that, that sounds like good, good enough to me. Um, definitely a lot of fine-tuning, a lot of new things coming um, in general because you guys are working really hard at it and you're passionate about it, which I can definitely tell, and that's that always translates well into a product if you're passionate about it. So definitely appreciate that and your time. I uh, really appreciate you coming on here and talking to us about ThinLink. I'm glad to be here. I always want to spread the word and hopefully find more users who are happy and, and ThinLink solves problems for them. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being on the show. And there's our video. I hope you enjoyed the interview that I had with Pierre. And if you want to give ThinLink a spin for yourself, then check out the Getting Started Guide right here on Learn Linux TV. In the meantime, I'm creating some additional content for you guys, so I'm going to get back to that. Be sure to subscribe to Learn Linux TV for the latest in Linux and also to see the latest content as soon as it comes out. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.